Revelation chapter 21. And we're just about ready to finish this teaching on Bible prophecy, having one more chapter to go to complete this time around. And it is certainly interesting. It is, to me, uh, my favorite subject in Scripture is preaching about salvation. And if I had a second subject, it would certainly be Bible prophecy. I've studied many, many years in Bible prophecy, have searched it out in depth, and believe that we have a fair understanding of how the Scriptures lays out uh, the end result for the earth and for mankind. It has been written by apostles and prophets, uh, given to them by the Spirit of the Lord with clarity that we can study and understand and know that we are living, and I believe, in the very end time. And I believe most, if not all, Bible prophecy teachers, uh, even those that are out of the faith, will agree that we are in that final generation, and I certainly believe that given the evil days that is upon us and the evil that is in the world. And again, as I quote so often, the Bible says, evil men and seducers shall wax worse and worse. Now, if you want to follow us in your Bibles or on the monitors, Revelation chapter 21, beginning with verse 1. Now, we remember in our last lesson that we studied, the 1,000-year millennial reign with Jesus Christ here on earth. And we studied the great white throne judgment, the judgment of sinners. And they will certainly stand before God to be judged and then ultimately to be cast into a lake of fire. Then after the 1,000 years is completed, then we'll have completed the seven days of creation, which is typified in 7,000 years. And then, of course, after that begins what the Bible refers to as an eternity, a space of time where there will be no watches or clocks or things or events is not measured by time. Time will cease to exist. It would just be for eternity, meaning a never-ending span of time forever and forever. So if we make it tonight, and I plan on it, don't you? It'll be forever, and we won't have to worry about being lost anymore. There'll be no more tears of sorrow. There'll be no more deaths uh, that we'll have to encounter in that place. So after the 1,000 years is fulfilled, the Bible says, John said, And I saw a new heaven and a new earth. Now what that's talking about, the new heaven, just simply means this first heaven, which is uh, this atmosphere around the earth. And I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth were passed away, and there was no more sea. And I think that maybe either two-thirds or three-fourths of the earth is covered by water. Is that right? It is. And I always found that kind of fascinating, that there's going to be no more sea. And, of course, God knows what he's doing. He certainly does. Uh, but that's what the Bible says. Now, my question in verse 1 is this. Will heaven and earth, as we see it, pass away? Is this to be taken literally? And it absolutely is. This earth, as we know it and see it today, one day will be destroyed, and will be recreated. Now, that will make the third phase of creation. We know by studying that uh, when Adam and Eve was placed in the garden, and the six days of creation, when God created man, and he created the beasts of the field, the fowls of the earth, then he created man, that there was a creation for Adam. But it was a recreation. We have shown in Scripture that this earth was already here when Adam got here. It was void and without form and darkness, the Bible says, was upon the face of the deep, which in, uh, gives the implication that this earth had been destroyed once before. And I think that we proved that in Scripture. So there was a creation. 
And if you had been in our Bible studies on the pre-Adamite world, you know that I teach uh, that it is my view that Lucifer ruled this earth once upon a time. And then when he rebelled against God, the Lord destroyed his kingdom, earth. And then we don't know how much time elapsed, but God decided to create man in his own image. So in order to do that, then he recreated the earth for Adam's sake and placed him in that beautiful garden. And now almost 6,000 years has passed. We have at least another thousand to go. And then will be the time when it will be destroyed once again, but recreated. And the Bible certainly bears this out. Matthew chapter 24, verse 32 through 36. Jesus speaking. He said, now learn a parable of the fig tree. Now he's given signs of the end time here, actually. Now learn a parable of the fig tree when his branches get tender and put forth leaves. You know that summer is nigh. <clears throat> so likewise ye, when ye shall see all these things, know that it is near even at the doors. And he's speaking of the end time. Verily, verily, I say unto you, this generation shall not pass. Now he was making a reference to a future generation, not the one that he was in 2,000 years ago, but I believe the one that we are in now, this generation, he said, shall not pass till all things be fulfilled. Verse 35 is where I want to make my point. He said, heaven and earth shall pass away, but my words shall not pass away. God is going to literally destroy this planet. It's going to come to a violent, violent end. Man can't even imagine the terror of the Lord and the anger and the wrath that God is going to pour out upon this planet. He's going to destroy the people that are left, that are disobedient unto him. It's going to be a sad, sad, terrible, horrifying time. I want to make it, don't you? I want to escape all of this. And God has made a plan for us this church, the bride of Jesus Christ, in this dispensation, if we'll obey the word of the Lord, if we'll repent of our sins, get baptized in water in the name of Jesus Christ, be filled with the Holy Ghost and live holy and dedicated before God, we can escape what is to come. And we have been studying it all through the book of Revelation uh, about the wrath of God, stars falling from heaven, creatures let loose out of hell upon this earth, wars and rumors of wars, Great hailstones falling upon this planet. Horrific things that are to come. And what that depicts is the anger of God. I'm telling you that we can't even imagine how angry God is right now. And I know that the love of God is still going forth. And God is still calling to the lost and the dying. But at the same time, God is so angry. And one day, this world and the inhabitants thereof will see the wrath and the anger of God. Peter speaks of it in 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 1 through 13. <clears throat> Peter said, This second epistle, beloved, I am now writing unto you, in both which I stir up your pure minds by way of remembrance that ye may be mindful of the words which were spoken before by the holy prophets and of the commandment of us, the apostles of the Lord and Savior. Knowing this, now Peter begins to give signs of the end time. Knowing this, that thou shalt come in the last days, that's where we are, scoffers, walking after their own lusts. I've never seen a time when man is walking after his own lust, laughing and mocking and proclaiming that there is no God and saying, where is the promise of his coming? After all, man has been preaching the coming of the Lord not just for the past 2,000 years, but since the beginning of time as we know it. 
Enoch also, the seventh from Adam, prophesied of these, saying, Behold, the Lord cometh with ten thousands of his saints to execute judgment. Jude 1, 14 and 15. So they've been prophesying of the destruction of this planet after Enoch was Noah. God was preparing or trying to prepare this world for his coming judgment. Yet, <clears throat> when it is now upon us, he said, you're going to see scoffers, mockers, people laughing and not believing, members of our own families will not come to the house of God. They don't want to come to church. They want, don't want anything to do with church or serving the Lord. And the sad part about it is we warn them and we warn them and we warn them until either they go out by way of death into eternity and are forever lost or this time that the writers are right enough will come upon them and catch them unawares. And once they're caught, there is no salvation for Gentiles anymore. It will absolutely be too late. But he said in that day, and there they are plenty of them here, where is, that's what they'll be saying, where is the promise of his coming? For since the fathers fell asleep, all things continue as they were from the beginning of creation. For this they willingly are ignorant of, that by the word of God, the heavens were of old, and the earth standing out of the water and in the water, <clears throat> whereby the world that then was being overflowed with water perished. And I teach that there has been two floods. Most people don't teach that, but I do, because it's a biblical fact. When you study the creation of Adam and the world then, the earth was void and without form, and darkness was upon the face of the deep, and water engulfed this planet then. And then he had to speak to the waters and had the waters separate and made the dry lands to appear. They was hidden by the water. And then we had the flood of Noah. Destruction. The destructive hand of God. God is angry. But the heavens and the earth which are now by the same word are kept in store, reserved unto fire against the day of judgment and perdition of ungodly men. The word perdition means destruction of ungodly men. When God destroys man for his disobedience and his sin and his wickedness that we're seeing in the land today. But listen to what he said. But beloved, be not ignorant of this one thing that one day is with the Lord as a thousand years and a thousand years is one day. The Lord is not slack concerning his promises. If this Bible says it, you better look for it. If God said it, he's going to do it. And he said, I'm going to destroy this planet, and not by water next time, but by fire. Fire and brimstone will rain down from the heavens. Nothing new. It rained down in the days of Sodom and Gomorrah. God will. It's not if he destroys, but it's when will he destroy God's going to destroy this planet. The Lord is not slack concerning his promises. Some men count slackness, but is long suffering to us were. Not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. See, it wasn't God's design for the greatest part of his creation to be lost, but it was God's plan for all creation to be saved. But he gave man a choice. You can serve me, or you can serve the devil. Take your pick. And for the most part, man has chosen, the Bible says, to serve the creature as opposed to the creator. And he will dearly, dearly pay for that one. When he wakes up on the other side of eternity, not having made their peace and let you sure with God, then they will face that eternal judge whose eyes is a flame of fire and his voice as the sound of many waters, judges them, and then at last has them cast into a burning lake of fire. Verse 10. But the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night, in which the heavens shall pass away with a great noise, 
Same thing Jesus wanted to say. And the elements shall melt with fervent heat. The earth also and the works that are therein shall be burned up. God's going to burn this thing. Seeing then that all these things shall be dissolved, what manner of persons ought ye to be? All in all holy conversation and godliness. God expects his people to be holy. He expects us to be godly. And folks, that's not a choice. That is a commandment from God that we are to be holy. We are to be as righteous as we can be in order to please Him. Looking for and hastening unto the coming of the day of God, wherein the heavens being on fire shall be dissolved, and the elements shall melt with fervent heat. Think about it. Zechariah prophesied of an intense heat coming. I personally think Zechariah's prophecy is making reference to nuclear explosions. Nevertheless, we, according to his promise, look for a new heavens and a new earth wherein dwelleth righteousness. And that's what it's all going to be about. The fire upon this planet is to cleanse this planet. Cleanse it of all sin. And in the days that we're reading about now, it will be a righteous and holy planet with a righteous and holy God, with righteous and holy people that in their dispensation sought out God and will serve Him all of the days of their life And we'll be rewarded in ways that we can't even understand the glories of God. But it takes living right, righteous and holy, standing firm upon the word of the Lord. And nothing less than that will do. Isaiah chapter 65, verse 17 through 25. Isaiah speaks. For behold, I create a new heavens and a new earth, and the former shall not be remembered nor come into mind. God's going to wipe it clean. But be ye glad and rejoice forever in that which I create. For behold, I create Jerusalem a rejoicing and her people a joy. And I will rejoice in Jerusalem and joy in my people. And the voice of weeping shall be no more heard in her, nor the voice of crying. And he's speaking directly to his people, Israel, the natural seed of Abraham through Isaac and Jacob. And for all that they have suffered down through the countless ages of time, he's telling them, if you'll hold on to me, Thus come the day that there will be no more sorrow, no more sadness, no more death, no more persecution, but they must turn to him. And so is it with the church. There shall be no more thence an infant of days, nor an old man that hath not filled his days. For the child shall die a hundred years old, but the sinner being a hundred years old shall be accursed. In this particular passage, he's also making reference to the lifespans during the time of the millennium, where it will be increased. Well, those days will be a type of the days of the Garden of Eden. And they shall build houses and inhabit them. Even sinners will be there. They will. That were, did not perish at Armageddon, or was not destroyed during all those world wars. And they shall build houses and inhabit them, and they shall plant vineyards and eat the fruit of them. They shall not build and another inhabit. They shall not plant and another eat. For as the days of a tree are the days of my people, 
and mine elect shall long enjoy the work of their hands. And what he's telling them, all down through the ages, Israel would be invaded by their enemies. Their lands taken. I remember the great man Gideon and how before God spoke to him and when he came to him, he was hiding out, threshing the wheat, afraid of the Midianites, I believe it was, because they would wait till Israel would plant the harvest and they would come in and take it away from them. And Gideon was hiding behind the threshing floor. But he said, those days are over. If you'll hold true to me, those days are over. They shall not labor in vain, nor bring forth for trouble, for they are the seed of the blessed of the Lord, and their offspring with them. So we see clearly in those passages of Scripture, as we go back to Revelation 21 and 1, that there absolutely is going to be a new heaven and a new earth. And this former shall pass away and never come into remembrance anymore. Showing the destructive hand of God. Verse 2 of Revelation 21. And I, John, saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down from God out of heaven, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And again, remember I've told you that these latter, latter chapters of the book of Revelation is not in chronological order. And again, he reverts back to teaching concerning the millennium in which that city, New Jerusalem, will actually and literally come down out of heaven. That city that is 12,000 furlongs high, wide, and square, with 12 foundations, John sees it coming down out of heaven. And I believe, and most Bible scholars do, that that new city will come right down where old Jerusalem is now. And that will be the headquarters of the bride and redeemed Israel during the millennium. Jesus speaks of it in St. John chapter 14, verse 1 through 4. He said to us, his people, Let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am, there you may be also. And whither I go, you know, and the way you know. Jesus was making a direct reference to what John is referencing here in verse 2 of Revelation chapter 21 of that beautiful, beautiful city that has walls of jasper, gates of pearl. The street of that city is pure gold. We can only imagine how beautiful that place is going to be. It's going to be beyond, be beyond imagination. If we could just only get in our hearts and minds the things that God has prepared for them that love Him. Paul said, I have not seen, nor ear heard, neither has it entered into the heart of man the things that God has prepared for them that love Him. If we can just hold on to the end. If we can just hang in there until the end, it's going to be well worth it. Verse 3 through 6, Revelation 21. And I heard a great voice out of heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men, and he will dwell with them, and they shall be his people, and God himself. Now, who is that? That's Jesus Christ. God himself shall be with them and be their God. And God shall wipe away all tears from their eyes. That's us. And there shall be no more death, neither sorrow nor crying, neither shall there be any more pain, for the former things are passed away. And he that sat upon the throne said, now we already approved just exactly who it is that was sitting on that throne. It was Jesus Christ. God himself. And he that sat upon the throne said, Behold, I make all things new. And he said unto me, Right, for these things are true and faithful. And he said unto me, It is done. I am Alpha and Omega. 
the beginning and the end. Is that not exactly what Jesus said referencing himself? I am Alpha and Omega. I am the beginning and the end. I will give unto him that is the thirst of the fountain of the water of life freely. These verses emphatically prove and teach us that Jesus is Almighty God, the one true God, the only God that there ever was, the only God that there ever will be. Jesus is the manifestation of God in the flesh. And man is so deceived in teaching that poison doctrine of the Trinity, saying and teaching that there is one God in three persons, the foundations of Catholicism. There is but one God, they say, in three persons, and that's the lie of the Trinity. They are right in proclaiming that there is but one God, but they are greatly in error in teaching one God in three persons. It is one God in three manifestations, one God in three modes, one God in three offices, meaning this, that that one entity God, that one individual God, created the heavens and the earth. Referred to in Scripture as the Father. There come a time that there needed to be a Savior, a Redeemer of fallen man. There needed to be a sacrifice given, blood shed, once and for all for the sins of the entire world. God said, I'll do it. I'll come down from heaven. I'll give my life, shed my blood for the sins of the world. But there was a problem with that. God had neither a life to give nor blood to shed. So what God did, he picked out a woman by the name of Mary, sent Gabriel to her, and said, now Gabriel, you tell her, I'm going to overshadow her, and she's going to conceive by the Spirit of the Holy Ghost, and she's going to have a child. And tell her that she is to name that child Yeshua. In English, it's Jesus. Gabriel comes to Nazareth. He appears to Mary and gives her the information that God is sending with. She looks at Gabriel and says, how can this be? Seeing I know not a man. He said, the power of the house shall overshadow thee. That's how it's going to happen. God, the Spirit, which is what God is in his origin, is going to overshadow you. A spirit hath not flesh and bone or flesh and blood. That's why he couldn't come in his origin. He needed a human body. So he overshadowed the woman. She conceived. And for nine months, that baby began to grow and was born in Bethlehem's manger, laid in Bethlehem's manger some 2,000 years ago. And what God did, being a spirit, went into that body. And he said to Mary, that holy thing that shall be conceived in thee shall be called the Son of God. That's where the confusion come in. Trinitarians did not have an understanding of what God was doing. Said, well, there must be two persons, the Father who fathered the Son, and the Son himself, there must be two entities, two persons. And Rome, under the leadership of Constantine, I believe it was, gathered his religious order together and said, you fellows figure this thing out. So they got together and said, wow, there must be at least two so they adopted the doctrine 
that there was two. After they adopted the doctrine that the Father and Son were separate entities, two persons, then they began to read the scriptures concerning the Holy Spirit or the Holy Ghost. They said, wow, we're leaving out something here. Because the Bible says that the Lord is that Spirit, and the Bible refers to the Spirit as God Almighty. So they said, we cannot leave out what they deemed the third person. So they said, now, as we understand it, there's one God in three persons. And the Father is a person himself. The Son is a person himself. And the Holy Spirit is a person himself. So there's three. So they drew up the doctrine, we believe in one God in three persons. One of the Father, one of the Son, and one of the Holy Ghost. But said they was all equal in power and in knowledge and shared glory. Which was contrary to what the Bible taught. What happened is, they introduced and built the Catholic Church upon that doctrine. It's the same today. Nowhere in this Bible, from Genesis through Revelation, does it ever make reference to God as three persons. It's not found in Scripture. Instead, we read Scriptures like 1 Timothy 3 and 16, and without controversy, great is the mystery of godliness, God was manifest in the flesh. We read of St. John 10 and 30, when Jesus said, I and my Father are one. St. John 14 and 9, he that has seen me has seen the Father. St. John 8 and 58, before Abraham was I am, Jesus speaking. St. John 1 and 1, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Verse 14 says, And the Word was made flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld His glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. All of these scriptures then contradicted the doctrine of the Trinity, the three-person theory. So you know what they said to explain it away? That the Trinity was not fully developed in the scripture. So true. It's not in the scripture at all. But there was a people, beginning with the apostles, that always believed that Jesus Christ was that very eternal God manifest or revealed in a robe of flesh for the sole purpose of redeeming mankind, that he would have a life to give and blood to shed. And he lived in that body for 33 and a half years, walked it to Calvary, allowed himself to be nailed to the tree, hung there for six hours. When it came time for the Son of God to die, he cried out, My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Because at that instant in time, the Spirit of God left that body of flesh. And when it did, immediately the Son died. And the Father went into the heart of the earth. The priest of the souls that was in prison there, that's sometimes disobedient days of Noah. One God in one person, and Paul explained it and said that Jesus Christ is the express image of his person. How much plainer than that can you get? There is one person in the Godhead, and it is the person of Jesus Christ, and God indwelled. So then when they adopted that theory, they said, well, we've got another problem. Here the church has been baptizing for 300 years in the name of Jesus Christ and in the name of the Lord Jesus. But they're leaving out the Father and the Spirit. So we're going to change water baptism from that in the name of Jesus Christ as in Acts 2.38 to the titles Listed in Matthew 28 19, when Jesus said, Go ye therefore, teaching all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. So they changed it. On that basis, 
not having understanding of the revelation of who God was, nor any understanding of Scripture, that when Jesus commanded his apostles to go into all nations and preach the gospel to every creature, he that believeth and baptized shall be saved, and he that believeth not shall be damned, in Mark chapter 16, and of course Matthew 28 and 19, is what they hence their whole doctrine on. Jesus said, baptizing them in the name of the Father. They knew that the name of the Father was Jesus. And the name of the Father and Son and the Holy Ghost, all three, is Jesus. They share one name because there's only one person. The Catholics didn't care and they don't care today. Neither does any denomination. You pick out, go up and down this valley and highways and byways and drop into the Baptist churches and the Church of God churches and the Church of Christ churches. And they all tell you, we believe in one God in three persons. That's Catholicism, and it is a lie from hell. It's man-made, and it is false, and it's not true. There is but one God, and his name is Jesus Christ. It's all there ever was and all there ever will be. He said, I am Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end. Jesus explicitly saying that I am the beginning. There can't be two beginnings. He said, I am the end. There can't be two endings. 1 John 5, 7, there are three that by record in heaven, the Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost. And these three are one. Catholics and Trinitarians cannot understand these things. They do not understand these things. Nevertheless, the truth will stand when the world is on fire. And I'll tell you what Jesus said. He said, you shall die in your sins. Except you believe that I am he, you shall die in your sins. That's what he said. I just believe it. They try to say, men of God like us and people like you, we are plural. But we don't believe everybody's saved. Because nowadays, the philosophy of religion and denominationalism is that everybody's saved. It don't matter where you go to church. It don't matter how you're baptized. It don't even matter if you're baptized at all. I'll tell you how much it matters. I got a little nephew decided he wanted to go to church. And going to this Trinitarian church, and he kind of talked to me a little bit. And I said, look, I said, they're Trinitarians. They're not right. I said, for starters, I said, you've got to be baptized in Jesus' name. Just a young boy, 14, 15, somewhere around there. I said, go home and read the book of Acts. Well, he goes and tells him. My uncle Ron said, you better baptize me in Jesus' name. Oh, well, I was hoping he'd go tell him that. While well, I wasn't expected, that's exactly what he baptized him. So he sent me a text message the other night. He said, Uncle, I, I got, got baptized. So I'm going to send you the video. You make sure they done it right. Sent me the video. And sure enough. He told that preacher he wanted to be baptized according to Acts 2 38, and that's exactly where that preacher got up. He wanted to be baptized this way, and that's the way we're going to baptize him. And baptize him according to Acts 2 38 in the name of Jesus Christ for the mission of sins. A man like that ain't worth his salt. Because if any way at all do, no way to do. I have more respect for somebody that stand up for what they believe and for somebody that will compromise. And they baptized that young boy just to satisfy him. He didn't no more believe that in nothing. And don't baptize ordinarily that way. But just because that 14-year-old boy or 15, however old he is, told him that his Uncle Ronnie said, you've got to be baptized in Jesus' name, in order to get him into their clutches, man, that's the way they baptized him. I'm telling you, they don't even believe in baptism at all. Now they tell him he don't have to speak in tongues. Well, there you go. See, you know what the danger of it is? And they, they say that I'm cruel and cruel hard and all that sort of thing. But there's a soul at stake. If you don't do it right, you'll die and go to hell. And I know you will. And that's why I'm not going to let up in this hour. I'm not going to compromise with false doctrine. I'm not going to compromise with anybody. I would have said the same if it had been my son or my daughter. 
if they go to a place like that. You can't make it in a place like that. Jesus and the Bible teaches us not but one way. And Jesus said in St. John 14, 6, I am the way, the truth, and the life, and no man can come to the Father but by me. We must stand. Back to Revelation 21. I'm going to try to get that young man out of that ungodly mess. He'll listen to me. It's sad. It really is. It's really sad. Back to Revelation, verse 7. It says, And he that overcometh shall inherit all things. And I will be his God, and he shall be my son. And again, signifying, I will be his God. Jesus Christ is our God. Verse 8. But the fearful, now I'm just reading this. I just believe it. This is what they said about it. But the fearful, and unbelieving, and the abominable, and murderers, and whoremongers, and sorcerers, and idolaters, and all liars shall have their part in the lake which burneth with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. I mean, that's what they said. I'm just reading what they said. Now, I wholeheartedly agree that if you fall into any one of these categories, you're going to die and go to hell. But that's God's plan, not mine. But you know who they look down upon for preaching it? People like me. They don't have no love of God about it. That's what they say. They actually say that about it. They get my personality confused with my message. That's what they're doing. Because I, I just can't put on one of them smiley faces like most preachers do and hug people right into hell. I don't know one way to put it. And that's plain. Someone told me just the other night, that I was in their conversation. Someone said, well, Ron, he's a good preacher. Man, he's just too plain talking. I don't, that's personality, I guess. And I can't change that. And that is true. And there are a lot more eloquent speakers and preachers than me. But I don't know but one way to tell you. Just tell you how it is. At least if I make you mad, I've told you the truth about it. You may get to thinking about it. See. But that's what they're confused, you know, Preacher's supposed to love everybody, I reckon. I tell you, the man that loves you, he'll always tell you the truth. He always will. No matter if, if he knows that you're going to get upset with him and you're going to get angry with him because he loves you, he'll tell you the truth. These people that tell you, just like they did that young man down there, they don't love him. They absolutely don't love that young boy. Well, if they did, they'd tell him the truth. But yet, they, now he's got in his mind, he's all right, and they're all right. And they're not. So pray for a young man that if he's truly sincere in heart, that God will give him revelation and understanding. Gladys has been talking to him, and I've talked to him, and I think he's come back for his own question. And, and I'll give him everything he needs to go down there and fight that devil he will. That's the part they don't like about me. Well, they're not angels. If you ain't an angel, we think the one thing else you are, and you're a devil. I know people don't preach like that, but it's the truth. It's the truth. I don't know, they say, you know, if you just lighten up just a little bit, you do a whole lot better. <laughs> now that's what they said, but it's the truth. You're either right or you're wrong. You're either in or you're out. Is that not where you see it? I mean, that that's just common sense to me. You know, they say, well, let's just let's just kind of back off a little bit of the brash preaching and kind of lighten up a little bit and watch what words you say. But I read about that in the Bible, where they said prophesying to us smooth things. See, that's what people want. People don't want you tell them how to live, how to get baptized, what they've got to believe. Prophesy, they said unto us, smooth things. See, everybody likes a smooth talking preacher. <laughs> but I say this, after it's all said and done, we will see. 
I've been in this long enough to know the accountability aspect of being a minister or a man of God. That I am absolutely will have to stand before God and give an account for everything that's come across this platform. I know that. So there's no room for smooth talking, smooth prophesying preachers. Paul said, preach the word, be instant in season and out of season, reprove, rebuke, and exhort with all long suffering and doctrine, for the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine, but after their own lust, each of themselves, teachers, have an itch in you. There are people that picks churches to go to, not based upon the word of God that's coming from that church, but the personality of the preacher. They are. Because he's more likable. He's more lovable. That's right. And I'll agree, they are a whole lot more likable and a whole lot more lovable than me. That's right. But I'm in this to be saved. And everybody that I preach to, I want them to be saved. We'll hug when we get to heaven. Is that all right? But until then, we'll just keep on preaching like we're preaching. And all I know, if it gets too hot for you, just get out of the kitchen. <laughs> well, that's another thing they don't like about me. So you, you ought not say things like that. Well, I'm telling you, they do, Big Church. Sure. You ought not say things like that. You know? But you've got to tell people the truth. I guess that's perhaps there is a better way to tell it, I guess, but I don't know. What you see is what you get. All right, verse 9. And there came unto me one of the seven angels, which had the seven vials full of uh, seven last plagues, and talked with me, saying, Come hither, I will shew thee the bride, the Lamb's wife. And he carried me away in the spirit to a great and high mountain, shewed me that great city, the holy Jerusalem descending out of God from heaven. Now, there is a teaching that he is describing that city that came down. But there is a teaching that there is not a real city. I believe I told you maybe last week. That when we sing the song, I'm going to a city that's 1,500 miles square which is relating to that city that's 12,000 furlongs long, high and wide. They say that it's not literal, but it is. That city that Jesus went away to prepare, it's got 12 foundations, and each foundation is the name for the 12 sons of Jacob, I believe. And then the gates that are one several pearl, or Reese name is the name of each of the 12 apostles. I believe it's literal. There's a street that is of pure gold. The walls are of jasper. Uh, that's where we will live for 1,000 years. But again, he's going into describing this city. Verse 11. Having the glory of God and her light was like unto a stone most precious, even like a jasper stone, clear as a crystal. And had a wall, great and high, and had twelve gates, and at the gates twelve angels, and the names written thereon, which are the names of the twelve tribes of the children of Israel, where I said vice versa. On the east three gates, and on the north three gates, and on the south three gates, and on the west three gates. So there's twelve gates. And I believe this is to be taken literally for sure. And the wall of the city had twelve foundations, and in them the names of the twelve apostles of the Lamb. We are built upon the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone. God planned all of this out before he ever put it into motion. And in God's great plan, he gave us the choice, if we want to get in and get in right, serve the Lord and enjoy all that heaven has to offer, or we can ignore and neglect, live and perhaps become rich in the world and have plenty of silver and gold, yet die without God. For what would it profit a man? He gained the whole world, Jesus said, and lose his own soul. 
verse 15 through 17. And he that talked with me had a golden reed to measure the city and the gates thereof and the wall thereof. And the city lieth full of square, and the length is as large as the breadth. And he measured the city with the reed, 12,000 uh, furlongs. The length and the breadth and the height of it are equal. And somebody measured that out to be actually 1,500 miles. And he measured the wall thereof 144 cubits, according to the measure of a man that is of Benjamin. And generally, most take uh, the measurement of a cubit to be uh, 18 inches. And the building of the wall of it was of jasper, and the city was pure gold, like unto clear glass. And the foundations of the wall of the city were garnished with all manner of precious stones. The first foundation was jasper, the second sapphire, the third chalcedonia, the fourth an emerald, the fifth sardonyx, the sixth sardis, the seventh chrysolite, the eighth beryl, the ninth a topaz, the tenth a chrysophorus, that's pronounced correctly, the eleventh a jacinth, the twelfth an amethyst. It would be beautiful. We can't even imagine the beauty of the city. And the twelve gates were twelve pearls. Every several gate, of, gate was of one pearl, and the street of the city was pure gold as it was transparent glass. We can't even imagine the beauty of that city. And I saw no temple therein. For the Lord God Almighty and the Lamb are the temple of it. Now, Trinitarians are going to read a scripture like this and say, And I saw no temple therein, for the Lord God Almighty and the Lamb. They say, See, there's two. No, it's not. It's two titles of the same God. It's just like when the Bible, how many, when it speaks up, we, we make a reference to the devil, we make a reference to Lucifer, right? So how many devils are they? Uh, yet the Bible refers to him as that old serpent and the dragon. That don't mean they're two. That means it's the same being with two or three different titles. That old serpent, the dragon, the devil, and Satan. There's not four devils, are they? Yet, that's how the scriptures refer to him. Same way here with God. And I saw no temple there, for the Lord God Almighty and the Lamb are the temple of it. The Lord God Almighty became the Lamb. And there is no temple because this Lamb was the temple of God. So easy to understand. And the city had no need of the sun, neither of the moon to shine in it, for the glory of the glory of God did lighten it, and the Lamb is the light thereof. And the nations of them which are saved shall walk in the light of it, and the kings of the earth do bring the glory and honor into it. And again, he's speaking of the millennium. There'll be there'll be cities that are saved there, and then of course there'll be the center city, the state Armageddon that will be there. And the gates of it shall not be shut at all by day, for there shall be no night there. Now remember, during this time, the devil will be bound for that thousand years. And they shall bring the glory and honor of the nations into it. And there shall in no wise enter into it anything that defileth, neither whatsoever worketh abomination. See, gays can't be saved if they stay gay. Lesbians can't be saved if they stay lesbian and live that lifestyle. No more than a liar. If you join church, you got to quit lying. Right? I mean, you join church, you got to quit drinking. The thief's got to quit stealing. You see, those things are abominations in the eyes of God. All sin is actually an abomination in the eyes of God. And he's telling us that these things shall not enter into that city, and there shall no wise enter into it anything that defileth. He said, anything that defileth. Neither whatsoever worketh abomination, or maketh a lie, but they which are written in the Lamb's book of life. And we know there's only one way to get your name written in the Lamb's book of life in this dispensation. That is to repent with God and, God and sorrow, which means you stop your sin and ways, Get baptized in water in the name of Jesus Christ. 
Seek for, be filled with baptism of the Holy Ghost with evidence of speaking in other tongues. Live a holy and dedicated life before God and endure until the end. And that'll do it. And if you'll do that, you can't miss it. You can't miss it if you'll do that. But if we try to leave any of those ingredients out. You see, it don't matter how much you're baptized in Jesus' name. If you're taught that you don't have to speak in tongues to have the baptism of the Holy Ghost, and you never get it, well, you can't be saved without the Holy Ghost. For the Bible says, by one spirit are we all baptized into one body. And we are sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise until the day of redemption. You've got to have the Holy Ghost. So the devil, if he can convince us that we don't have to repent, or we don't have to be baptized, or we don't have to have the Holy Ghost, or we don't have to live holy, then we leave one of those four things out. It doesn't matter that you've done the other three. You're still lost. Then we've got to obey those and fulfill the whole plan for salvation.